Welcome to the family, Madrigal, where all the people are fantastical and magical. It's the family, Madrigal. Everyone except, well, Mirabel, who's still waiting on a miracle. Encanto is the story of this family and this miracle that has blessed them. Encanto is magic, quite literally. Encanto in Espanol means a charm or a spell. Though you might also call a small town with beautiful historical buildings full of charm and Encanto. And in Spanish, when you love something, you say, me encanta. Me encanto eso. I love this. Or quite literally, I'm enchanted by it. Estoy encantada. And if you look up the word in an English dictionary, encanto means a song. Developed in Italy in the 14th century, that is performed without musical instruments in which several singers sing different notes at the same time. Yes, see, sí, yes, so, yes, this is it, all of this. What a perfect description of this film, literally and figuratively as we explore their enchanted lives and their enchanted town while each family member sings in their own unique way with their enchanted gifts. Mirabel is proud of her family and their gifts. If not a little jealous, and to be honest, insecure about her lack of one. At six years old, each child undergoes a ceremony to receive their gift. The youngest one set to get his and move into his own room where his magic can unfold. Mirabel's oldest sister has incredible strength. She can hold anything, cows or donkeys, as we learned earlier, other farm animals, water, piano, you name it, she can bear it. Her middle sister grows beautiful flowers. She's as enchanting as the world she creates. Her cousin, Dolores, has the gift of listening and can hear everything that happens miles away, while cousin Camilo can transform into other people. Her mom has the gift to heal with her food. Her tia, her aunt, can change the weather. And her uncle Bruno? We don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> but I suppose you should know. He has the gift of prescience, and that's what got him into trouble. He gets blamed for what he sees. So he ran away because he just seems to screw everything up. Mirabel can relate. He's an outcast, and so is she. Because as, as a sweet, newly minted six-year-old, eager and nervous as her family looked on, her proud abuela overseeing the ceremony, Mirabel stepped forward to receive her gift, and it didn't come. And it felt like she'd gone and screwed everything up, too. In the back of her mind, she always held on to this hope that she'd received her gift someday. She would be special like everyone else in their own special, unique ways. But her littlest cousin, Diego, received his gift, the be ability to befriend and talk to animals. And he moved out of their shared room leaving her all alone, the only magical, without a gift, without a power. It's not hard to identify with Mirabel. I'm sure each of us has felt like we don't fit in at one time or another. We wonder why our sister is so smart, our brother so good looking, our cousin, so good at sports. 
And then we grow up and wonder, why didn't I get that job? Why did she get the raise? Why can't I afford a house? Why did he get the guy? Why couldn't I steal her heart? How come she can have babies? Why? Why isn't it easy for me? Why does everything come so naturally for them? How come everybody else can juggle it all and I can't? Why? 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 Why am I so different? That's the question after all. It's the one Mirabel asks over and over. Why am I different? She's got such a good heart and she's so committed to her familia. She deserves a gift too. She deserves to fit in, to belong. But she always feels left out. And because Abuela runs the show, the matriarch of the family, the original recipient of the gift that changed their lives and those around them, Mirabel desires her approval. Of course. Of course she does. Of course she wants her grandmother's approval. She just can't get it. And sadly, it feels like she can't get her love either. So Mirabel wonders what she can contribute if she can't bring something magical to the table. It feels like she has nothing to offer and thus like she has no value. Unworthy of a gift, worth less. Wishing she was something she isn't, wishing she had what they all have. Not unlike the early church where each had different gifts, jealous of each other, some thinking their gift was better, others feeling like they had no gift at all, each wanting to feel special, chosen, bickering amongst themselves, so focused on their differences they couldn't find their commonalities, they failed to experience the spirit among them. Now, for the most part, the Familia Madrigal gets along. Life is pretty magical, even aside from Mirabel's lack thereof. Except for that one subject we avoid talking about. Ugh, why does he keep coming up? We're not supposed to talk about Bruno. But let's talk about him. He's the reason why everything's wrong. His predictions, he causes all these problems better without him in sight. That's the best thing to do with things that make us uncomfortable, right? Hard realities we just can't bear to face. Predictions about our future, just ignore it. Just stuff it down. Down, 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 and don't. Talk about it. So they don't. They think Bruno has left them and ostracized he has in some ways, but in reality, he's living just behind the walls, just out of sight, always present, like the rats that have become his only friends, Dolores, the only one who hears his muffled shuffling far away within the magical depths of the casita until cracks suddenly appear in their perfect home. They think the problem is him until each of them starts to wonder if the problem is them. Luisa, the oldest, the strongest, the one who can bear all the burdens, suddenly admits to the pressure. Recognizing this heavy load that she carries, she stumbles, first a little, then a lot. They all begin to stumble as the house begins to crumble. Mirabel sees it first. Terrified, she shares it with the others, but rather than listen, her grandmother shuts her out. 
proclaims, the miracle is fine, everything's fine. Now Mirabel is the problem because she dared to talk about what was happening, the crumbling of their world. It's funny how truth-telling can get you into trouble. After all, Bruno just sees the visions. He doesn't create them. He does interpret them. He tells them what he sees. He speaks the truth even if he doesn't understand it. Actually, that's the problem with the vision that came right after Mirabel didn't get a gift. It wasn't entirely clear. But nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear the future is unclear. Now, Mirabel is connected to their home, to the house, the casita. It has a life of its own. It's a friend that loves her and supports her. She alone seems to see what's happening to it. She's scared. She loves her house. She loves her family. But she's asking too many questions. She's getting more and more like Bruno every day, exposing a truth that nobody wants to see. And the candle, the candle light that burns eternal is starting to flicker. And Abuela, even as she denies it, fears the miracle has run out. What would happen if it did? The only way to figure it out is to face the family trauma. Something nobody wants to do. See, there's no evil monster in this film. Disney is once again taking us into the depths of our psyche, inviting us to look at a different kind of monster. It's easy to blame the bad guy, the wicked witch, the evil stepmother, the devil. But what happens if there is no bad guy, no devil to take the blame? When we look at this through a theological lens, we ask ourselves the same question. If there is no bad guy, no devil, no Satan pulling the strings, and why do all these bad things happen? How, how do we move through them? A bad thing happened to this family. And in some ways, it would be really easy to interpret the magic that they share exactly as they do, as a miracle. A miracle given to them as a consolation prize for the awful thing that happened. And many do interpret it this way. Something bad happens, but since you aren't bad people, you'll be rewarded with something else to get you through. Heard that theology before? Now in reality, if you're going to get to know the family Madrigal, you have to hear the whole story. It doesn't begin with Mirabel and her magical cousins. It actually all begins with this traumatic experience. Abuela wasn't always blessed. The story begins with her and her husband and their babies. They're a refugee family who had to flee their home when it was overtaken. And while we can certainly lay some bad guy blame on the people who set fire to their city and their home and ran them out of town, colonizers maybe, we could go there. It's not all the way spelled out. But we do know this family is seeking safety, refuge, and as they flee with their triplet babies in arms, Abuela, then a young mother, is separated from her husband crossing a river, and he's killed. 
and it's a terrible death. It's heartbreaking. She's left alone to parent her triplet babies without a home, without a future, without hope. Stricken with grief, she's frozen with fear. And that's when the miracle occurs. Born of these gifts of love, they were bestowed upon their family. And they built this magical casita, and with it an encanto, a charming little town filled with vecinos, neighbors they keep safe and happy through their gifts. And it would be very easy to interpret the gifts precisely as they do, as a prize, a consolation prize for the death of her husband, their father and grandfather. But we are invited to look deeper. What if the gifts, so long interpreted as miracles, aren't miracles at all, but rather coping mechanisms to deal with the trauma? Encanto, as enchanting as it is, invites us to look at trauma. And today, it invites us to look for God in the midst of trauma. We want to see magic. But when it all starts to crumble, we realize that the magic isn't all it's cracked up to be. Instead, it's just cracked. Louisa, who tries to carry it all and admits the pressure that she feels carrying the weight on her shoulders. Isabella, who covers everything with beauty, including herself, while masking her internal feelings. Camilo, who pretends to be everybody else, taking on their identities but never fully embracing himself. Dolores, who hears everything but says nothing. Peppa, who changes the weather but can't actually control it. And Mirabel's mother, Julieta, who goes around healing everyone with food. Here, eat this, it'll make you better. They're all coping from this incredible, unspeakable trauma. And at one level, you can interpret this to say good things can happen from bad experiences. Yes. Yes. But the problem is, everything is crumbling before them. They have to face the trauma. Shutting Bruno out and refusing to talk with him or talk about him, that's not going to make it better. Shushing Mirabel and refusing to believe her, that will only quicken the quake. It's only when Mirabel is brave enough to face her pain, her own insecurity at not receiving a gift, to embrace her shunned uncle with all of his visible pain and woundedness, to name the crumbling of their house around them, to return to the scene of their family trauma, wading deep into those dark waters. It's only then that real healing can occur. It would be easy for Mirabel to focus in on what she didn't have and just feel sorry for himself or continue on pretending that everything's perfect. But she who seemed so ordinary, who waited on a miracle, soon discovered that she was the miracle. And it didn't come with a magical gift. I'd like to make this connection in a very direct way this morning. It's not magic that makes a miracle. It's not magic. It's not the magical gifts of the Familia Madrigal, just as it was not the magical powers attributed to Jesus. The miracle comes in the ordinary in the eyes of the one who can actually see, Miralo, Mirabel. 
you. With eyes to see, look, for the kingdom is among you. It's so easy to be impressed by magic, isn't it? Whether it's controlling the weather, healing the sick, transforming into something else, all of which were attributed to Jesus, by the way. But what if the miracle is being able to face the hard things, to meet the trauma, and then experience healing in the face of that pain? What if that is not just Mirabel's miracle, but it's also Jesus's? And if that's the case, if Jesus is less a magician with spectacular power and more a truth teller, a seer, a courageous prophet who named the illness among them, whose miracles come in the power to face trauma, then maybe, maybe, we can face ours. Personal, familial, societal. Because the Madrigal family isn't the only family with generational trauma. Pain that begets more pain and more pain. We've been dealing with it, or not dealing with it, at some level since Adam and Eve. And no, I don't mean that literally. But each of us tries to cope in our own ways. Many of us appear incredibly successful at it. Some of us incredibly dangerous to ourselves and others. But when we are brave enough to face it, to see it, to name it, to meet it head on with love, a very different kind of miracle can occur. And maybe that's what Jesus was trying to teach us all along. Maybe that's what the early church and the current church have failed to see as we have looked for, counted on, and compared our gifts all these thousands of years. The gift was always love. Love in the face of fear, love in the face of trauma, love when our hearts are breaking and our world is crumbling around us, not to be unafraid or silenced, but be bold enough to see, to see the pain around us, to use our voices, to name the truth, even when it's hard, even when it hurts. Because that's where the miracle occurs. In the ordinary of our world, not superheroes with superpowers, but ordinary people who are so easily passed over to the strong, the beautiful, and the powerful. It's always, it's always been in the ordinary that the Spirit makes its most profound of miracles. Maybe we're just too afraid to admit it. So we prefer to make Jesus the Superman. And we look to others with their incredible gifts. Because we can't believe that we might just be the ones our world needs. Stop waiting on a miracle. Mira, you with eyes to see, look. The kingdom is among us. And the spirit that used that old, ordinary Mirabel is waiting on you and me. Animate your faith. Amen.